So I, I work on insects, so I'm a little outside of everything we sort of seen in a day and a half. I do a lot of preconditioning and I have been doing it for almost 10 years. I appreciate everybody that works in vertebrates because you guys have a lot of hoops to go through that I don't. Right? I, in the space that you can rear and maintain uh, a few rats, for example, I can have 200,000 flies. Right? Each one of those trays holds a, a hundred vials. Each vial can hold a hundred flies, and it can have 200,000 in what looks like a refrigerator. Right? And other things that happen is in little amounts of shells, I can have discrete, custom made, different types of containers for different types of moths, beetles, flies, and do all sorts of very interesting sort of whole organismal things. My group goes all the way from the cellular level to whole organismal to transgenerational work, looking how babies and grandbabies deal with preconditioning. And literally when you work with this many insects, right, when I take out an experiment and irradiate 20,000 flies and they all die, you literally get awards, right? This is how people are happy that you just kill a bunch of insects, right? If that happens to vertebrate people, then you get into trouble, you have to write letters, explanations, necropsies. I literally get awards, so it's a, it's a, it's a different world altogether. And I come to this uh, preconditioning world, so to speak, from the environmental stress. Right? Uh, at the core, my lab is just a basic physiology lab trying to understand how environmental stress affects us. Not only at the cellular level, but about the whole organismal level, not only in a day or two, but for the whole life. Right? And so we define stressors or environmental insult as sort of anything that can affect fitness in the classic evolutionary way, meaning babies. Right? How many, how much copies of your genes can be out there, both in children and F2 generations and so forth and so on. Right? So we're talking about things that affect development, reproduction, lifespan, health span, senescence, right? And I say affect, and I, you know, that could be either way, right? That's why I sort of concentrated here in, in the effect, because it could be a positive or a negative effect, as we've seen here. And so we work with temperature. We work with water, right? Dehydration and overhydration, actually. We work with gas mixes, right? Low oxygen, no oxygen. And we work with radiation, both ionizing and non-ionizing. So we will work with UV and X-rays and gamma. And all of these have something in common. And we've sort of seen it here. Some have flat out said it. A lot of you have sort of hinted at it. All of these stressors manifest themselves in a basically identical uh, mode of action, if you were. That's oxidative stress, right? That's the idea that through mitochondria, you, you change the rate of free radical production when you're exposed to environmental stress. And so this is what my group focuses on, on how to, to understand this and take advantage of it. Right? And so we know, because we've seen quite a bit of it, we have targets of uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species, right, which are your nucleic acids, your protein, your lipids. This can all be quite devastating at the cellular and organismal level, but we do have this far less sort of understood extensive signaling that is involved, right? That the need for RRS to be present in order for the, these responses to become adaptive, right? In order for you to have overall hormesis out of some of these responses. <clears throat> we use radiation because we all know this about radiation. I mean, it, it was clear from our launch time that that's not the main component, but everybody, this idea of aerophobia, right? It sort of comes to the idea that Radiation disrupts, right? You create double, bre double stranded breakages in DNA, you can disrupt lipid membranes, you can do a lot of horrible things with radiation. Yeah, we know, if you go really high, right? But if you go low, it's different. And the second effect that radiation tends to have, especially at these lower levels, is the generation of free radicals, right? And so if that dose, as we know, is parameterized in such a way that we do low level free radical production, that can actually create the adaptive response. But if we go somewhere between low and too high, then we actually create mortality, right? And some of the uh, traditional cancer radiation treatments 
lead to some pathologies that are linked to free radical damage, right? To sort of these protein carbonyls and lipid damage long term that actually lowers performance. So as I was said last night, I come to this from this idea of the sterile insect technique, right? So I come to this really from, from left field. This was an idea that you radiate flies, male flies, you release them into a field, literally, by planes, right? This is done all along the West Coast, Oregon, uh, Washington, California. It's done all over uh, Florida, right? Miami, Sarasota, Tampa, and it's done almost weekly, right? In some cases in Florida, it's done preventively twice a week, currently, right? And this is because in the 50s, the, 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 the beef, the U.S. beef industry was actually saved by this technique, lowering a horrible pest that was invasive all the way from the U.S. back to a native range in Panama. It was there that the technique became inefficient because it was the native range of the flies, and now the females could tell the radiated flies were damaged. Right? We couldn't. We had all this work, but the females can tell females, and you laugh because females can always tell. Right? <laughs> we can fool each other really easily. Fooling females is very hard. Right? So we, we have this framework, right, which is the, the, where we come at this. We have increased free radicals, right? In, in the framework, we're assuming we have a higher increase that we want, right? This leads to lipid and protein damage. Lipid damage is going to lead dysfunctional cell membranes and apoptosis. Uh, protein damage is actually going to lead to dysfunctional gene products, right? Together, this leads to damaged tissues. In the case of something that flies, we're talking about decreased flight. Decreased flight is important not because you can't get around, but because as you'll see in a, in a few slides, there's a lot more to actually being a fly and flying than flying. We use wings for a lot more things, right? And so this, this work was actually started at, at the University of Florida working with basically a local pest, right? And so some of the work that we did early on, we show this. We radiate these flies. We're using 70 gray, which seems scary because it will kill all of us. It has no immediate damage. It only makes the flies sterile, right? But in a competitive mating trial where they get an irradiated fly and a fly that didn't receive irradiations, females prefer unirradiated flies three to one. So 75% of the time, they prefer, you know, an unirradiated fly. They can tell somehow these flies are damaged, right? So we were tasked to imp with improving this and to that end, we sort of focus on what really happens, right? And it's all about the mating in this context, right? Or in any context, let's face it. We have, you may be familiar with some birds that heavily display, or maybe just with the mammals that do it, right? They, they have this costly ornamentation, and the whole purpose of that is to show who is the better male, right? Flies do it. This is the boxing flies. They literally box in walnuts, and the loser falls out of the walnut, and then the winner stays there until a female comes in. So we're working with the Caribbean fruit fly, which is a fly about 10 times the size of Drosophila. It's an invasive pest that now is established in Florida. And actually, in Gainesville, they rear millions of these a week because they get released around the state. Right? And so they have a very complex mating behavior. And we, and we are, as humans, right, we're not, we understand mating behavior. There's a lot of things that are expensive that sometimes have to be done, right, for for impressing the ladies. In this particular fly, this, this fly will spend day hours, right? Between 10 and maybe one or two in the afternoon every day, displaying to other males. And it has nice banded wings that allow it to sort of pretend it's bigger size when they go like this. They do a little dance, males dance for hours to each other until one male is the dominant, right? The, the flies go like this, which to me is the equivalent of, of going like this, right? Some point, some males get, for lack of a better word, intimidated, and now only the, the strongest male stays. And the female comes in at this point, right? Hours into this, right? Metabolism in the afternoon, you know, you're going through your energy, a lot of expense. When the females come in, the male has to kiss her. And she wants the male to see if it's a good kisser. And he actually kisses her butt. Literally, right? Not figuratively, which uh, some of us have done, but, but quite literally, right? After that, the female's like, now kiss me in the mouth, right? And so he has to do that. He has to kiss her in the mouth 
sometimes lick our head. This is all part of what's now five hours in before nothing happens, right? At this point, the female was like, okay, you can get on top of me. And the male was like, woohoo, right? No, now the female says, I'm gonna sing. And now you have to match my song, right? <laughs> if you can't match my song precisely, I'm literally gonna push you out and hit you until you can't walk again, right? And that's what happens. Female makes a wing, ultrasonic wing song with her wing vibrations, the male has to match it. The moment the male can't, the female kicks him off and starts hitting him, right? And we study up to a week where that male never mate with any females. It's like they all know, right? This one just told the other 300. It's like, yeah, that's damaged goods. <laughs> we don't know how they know, right? What we do know is what we thought, right? Is that it has to do with free radical damage, affecting proteins, affecting lipids, in a way that affects tissues, in a way that affects wing vibrations, which is the fastest possible wing movement you can make, right? It's a lot more intense than flying. I would tell my undergrads, you watch for this state, you know, when you see the wings disappear. The vibrations are so fast that you can't see the wings, right? So, so it is highly metabolic, and we think this is the point where we can find if our interventions are working, right? So we know we're not going to be able to disrupt the high levels, but the low levels that produce excess free radicals, that was our target, right? Something that could disrupt that. And so for that, you know, I don't have to introduce this, right? That's when we stumble into the idea for me, says, where before, for years, I've been sort of publishing under the sort of cross-tolerance name, not really sort of linking it into what, what we all know and love, right? And to that end, I focus in low oxygen. We started with anoxia because it's easy, because insects survive anoxia, because you don't have to have special equipment or special gases to do anoxia. You just flush something with nitrogen, and you're good to go, right? And I wanted to see, you know, how, how bad anoxia really is. So we did a series of experiments, which I'm not going to bore you with. But basically, these flies can take 48 hours with no oxygen. And presumably, at least for a few weeks that we track them, live normal lives. So we decided an hour. You know, that seems reasonable if they can take 50. or We know that they can't take 72, but we know 48 works. And so <clears throat> to start this, we, we went to some really high radiation doses, right? So you got two, three, and 400 gray, right? None of us are going to survive that under any context 10 times over. And the flies didn't either, right? Especially at 400 gray, which was our, our really our negative treatment. This is why, you know, we're on the bottom side of the U-shaped curve. We're really just trying to, like, knock them out. And it's like, now that we found this, we wonder what one hour of anoxia could do. So we would expose the flies to an hour of anoxia prior to irradiation. This is what it can do. Right. You go from 95% mortality at 400 to almost no mortality. They all survive it, right? And, and that, yeah, I mean, there were, I saw some jaws, and, you know, I, we were surprised. And when Ed was talking about one of his advisors wanting him to repeat stuff, I was the one that my postdoc advisor told me, stop, you've done it like 16 times. And I was like, yeah, but that's, that can't be true. I built errors into the thing. I had my undergrads that were on train try it. Everybody made it work. I mean, we, it was a thing, right? And we were shocked. But it's okay, survival doesn't mean anything, right? Let's see what else happens. That's just two days after treatment. Let's look at flat ability, right? In, in the same sort of line of experiments, at 400, yeah, if they can't survive more than a day, they're not gonna fly which is four days later. So yeah, we had no flyers, right? And flight decreased because we're on that side of the U-shaped curve. But now, flight was rescued, right? So now these guys are not only surviving at a high rate, they're flying where before they couldn't. And the ones that barely could, even at the other doses, right? More of them are flying in a way that, you know, you can't really distinguish more, much from the controls. So now we're impressed. Now we're four days out. Uh, we have survival, we have flight. And we wanted to see what happens. I mean, can they, how long can they really live? Well, this species lives about five months, right? So if you see here, somebody about five months and, and the anoxia by itself didn't really boost that. But it did on the other treatments, right? At 200 gray, we got, they were surviving a month. Now they survived three months, right? 
At 300 gray, they went from surviving three weeks to, again, almost four months. I mean, almost three months. Right? And at 400 gray, the highest level, which they didn't survive a day, now some of them were surviving two months. Right? So, so the effect, at this point, we're really convinced that it was free radical related, right? We mediated, we, we lower the free radical, we prevented maybe a lot of the free radical formation and damage to a way that they didn't have full normal five months li life, but they have impressive, right? Some of these curves, like the 400, you know, it sort of has a normal longevity curve. It's just, instead of 22 weeks, it just ends at eight, but they had 400 gray, which is a massive amount of radiation. So now we wanted to move into what we call low dose. Go back to 70 gray. Go back to the dose that the grant at the time said we had to work because it was agricultural and that's a sterility dose. But it's also not an immediate mortality dose. And so, yeah, there we didn't see much improvement in immediate mortality because there was no immediate mortality. But there was a problem with flight immediately, right? And so when we threw anoxia at them, we rescued it. The ones that received the low dose and flight was affected, then now were to control levels, right? So they were as propensitious to fly as ones that were never irradiated or never received anoxia, right? So we, th we felt really good. And now we wanted to explore this further, right? We looked at what might be involved. And so we did a total antioxidant capacity assay. Those of you familiar, it's just basically total antioxidant power of, of everything that's in the aqueous form uh, extraction of, uh, of fly lysate. And we found that there was a huge boost. The thing that took us back is that this increase happened during the hour of anoxia. There's no recovery, there's no reperfusion here. Reperfusion occur at zero. And so that allowed this to be high for about 24 hours. Then it drops dramatically. But zero means, yeah, samples that just finished the hour of anoxia were frozen before they were reperfused. And during that time, there was this increase, right? We actually link this to, to some of the antioxidants, and this was very targeted based on, on literature and, and, and sadly kind of cockiness, I think. But, uh, but it, sort of, it sort of played out well in the end. We look at superoxide dismutase in the mitochondria and the cytosol and glutathione peroxidase. We looked at five other six things that didn't change, right? These are the things that were more significant. And the mitochondria form of SOD came up during the zero, during that hour that they were in anoxic. So during the exposure of anoxia, before reperfusion, there was that increase. Same with GPX, right, glucotherm peroxidase, came up. Now once they were reperfused, we saw things like the cytostolic SOD coming up during the recovery period, right? So, so we felt that we had at least a, a little bit of an explanation, and then we can move forward, right? The next step was this longevity with, with this low dose. And so even though I'm just showing you 10 weeks, at 10 weeks, the irradiated flies are almost dead, right? Instead of the 22-week lifespan, they actually only live 12, right? And at 10, 90% of them are dead. But the ones that receive the anoxia conditioning, only 30% of them are dead, right? So there's, there's a big difference. They, they're doing much better over here in orange, right? And it's orange and blue because it was the University of Florida and the, the colors. The controls here, both the oxygen control and the anoxia control, you know, there was a little bit of different. The anoxia did boost a little bit early on, and there was a little change in the rate of aging, so to speak. But they're doing much worse than the condition irradiated flies. So there, there was a boost that we didn't expect. We expected all three lines to be here and these guys down here. To this day, we, we haven't been able to account for this huge improvement there. What really got us going was that the separation here at a month was huge. It's huge because even though they live five months, a fly that's a month old is, is old, right? It's considered an old fly. They don't live a month in the wild. It, it, by all accounts, this fly shouldn't be performing. So then we focused a series of experiments there to see what was going on. It's important at this point to mention, because of some of the talks we've had yesterday, the effect was male specific. We didn't see it in females, right? I tell my, my lab is mostly female. I tell them um, females are already pretty good and males need a lot of help, right? We went to other non, this was a non-model. We went to another non-model, a moth. Same thing, improvements in males, 
no improvement in females. Now we're done it in four different species, including Drosophila, and the pattern is still the same. Males get a benefit, females do not, right? I told my wife every day, yeah, honey, you're perfect, right? So, we improve lifespan, but we know all of us, right? And even in the back of our heads, if we don't even say it, what we're really talking about here is health span, right? We don't want an extension of any sort of uh, longevity purposes that extends the period of convalescence, right? We want to decrease that. So if we're going to increase life, we want to increase the period of activity, the good parts, right? And so before, when I show you the mating, this was at 10 days, at 12 days, actually. So these were like, you know, teenagers, late teenagers, early uh, college student flies. And so the three to one ratio that the non-irradiated uh, uh, flies, females prefer the non-irradiated males three to one, now will switch, right, to actually three to one in the other favor. So now females, if you give them two irradiated males, they prefer the conditioned male three to one, right? And so if you actually gave them a conditioned irradiated male and a control that wasn't, they can't tell the difference. It's actually 50-50 straight up, right? Here's where we came up with the GC hypothesis, which is not after me, but after this individual here, which if you don't recognize, you will in the next slide. And so we wanted to see what happens at 32 days, right? When the flies are considered old, right? And so this is what happens at 32 days, right? Now the preference goes from three to one to 19 to one. All the flies love the Clooney flies. I mean, the Clooney flies get all the ladies. And I don't think there's any surprise to anybody about that. But we, we don't expect this. I mean, this is right, 19 to one, one. 5%, it's randomness. Randomly, the Steve Buscemi flies get a, get a mating, right? So the, what really happened here at 35 days post-treatment was it wasn't just a s switch in the curve. We actually, it's a change of the slope of the curve, right? The ch rate of aging change, right? We have the periods here where the curve is flatter, but the blue curve dives in faster, right? And we actually, uh, there's some, some proportional hazards analysis and risk ratio analysis and show that it is, it is the mortality risk that actually change, right? And this is why all of a sudden you, you have this huge boost in performance in flies that shouldn't even be able to mate, right? We actually use young females. So we didn't use all females because they actually they wouldn't mate either. And, and so that was the preference, right? We even competed the old Clooney flies with young flies. Guess what? Females couldn't tell. A fly that was 10 days old versus one that was 35, that had been irradiated or not, that was conditioned. They just couldn't tell these flies were that much better. And we have some data that I'm not going to bore you with where we show a decrease in oxidative damage to lipids, to proteins. And so there, there was an actual decrease in, in physical damage, right? But that's led to some of the current work we do in the lab now. Because this is really, I mean, if we don't say it, I'll, I'll say it, right? This is what we want to do. We want to be as good as we were when we were young when we are older. And that's, I think that's the reason he saved the same bikini, right? Because <laughs> he was hoping he could get into it. It doesn't work quite like that. So this brings us into the beetles, right? And so these are mealworm beetles. You can buy them at the pet shop. That is the main reason that we work with them. And so the first thing we tried is just to see, we did the same anoxia parameterization, and we came up that three hours seems like a good thing to try based on their survival. And here we see a nice shifting of the curve. So basically, the, the same we were talking about last night, somewhere between 30 and 40% increase in longevity, just by giving them one three-hour exposure to anoxia when they're young, right? And so we are, this is all sort of active things that we're currently exploring, but this is where the age component came into our hermetic treatments, right? We, we didn't think, we knew those, obviously, it's a big deal, but we never thought age was, and just by chance, with timing and students, we stumbled onto this effect. That first graph, right, which is now done here, was done when they were a few days old as adults, right? And so you have the 30-some percent increase in longevity. If you wait two weeks and do it again, nothing happens. You know, these are not the same group of individuals, a different group of individuals, but they're just two weeks older. Gave them the three hours of anoxic conditioning, 
there's no improvement. They just look completely, right, if you sort of follow it. Completely normal. If you go another two weeks, and what we call now they're a month, so we call them old, they don't survive it at all. I mean, here they survive it fine at two weeks, right? They don't get the big boost that they got at day one, but now a month later, they all die, right? And so this is what we're currently exploring to sort of try to understand what's going on here with, with age and why we seem to get better protection the younger we try this, right? And again, there, there's a, I don't have the data here, but there's an opposite. If we go too young, we also don't get it either, right? So there's a, a magic number that we're figuring out has to do around sexual maturation that actually gives us the peak most improvement in performance, right? And so, you know, everything that we've done to this stage has shown us that we have a decrease in cellular, an increase in cellular defenses that decrease oxidative-related damage, and there's a big improvement in organismal performance, right? And we tried this in a few different species. We're actually getting into roaches with this right now. We have two transcriptomic uh, experiments going on, so we can get gene pathways and all the other things that are involved because that was very targeted with the SODs and some of the antioxidants, but we know there's so much more involved. We're trying to figure that out. And I, this was one out of agriculture, but now I have NIH uh, funding to look at immunity. Right? We all know immunity decreases with age. We are finding that a preconditioning boosts immunity in older individuals, and we want to explore that further, as well as this transgenerational effect of preconditioning. That in the past, we've shown that the babies right here in the, in the light gray and the grandbabies, th there's more of them, right? if they were preconditioned as opposed to the ones that were just stressed or in this case irradiated without the conditioning, right? So with that, I want to thank Ed for the invitation and Denise for all her hard work and my group because nothing with hundreds of thousands of uh, insects gets done with a, without a huge crew. And so I have a very, I'm very fortunate to have an awesome crew of both undergrads and grad students. Uh, and the funding was USDA and uh, NIH and a little bit of NSF, so. Thank you very much. In terms of the transgenerational effects that you're seeing, is that only in females and, or in males? Ah. So from, from what we saw here, where we actually see big improvements mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, sort of uh, more numbers, let's say, right? More surviving in babies and grandbabies, F1 and F2. It has to do with your grandmama. So everything we've done here, I mean, you know, I get a lot of rollback because people don't like calling bugs grandbabies and, and grandmamas. But it's a grandma effect we're seeing here which is ironic because on the performance of the males, we were seeing big male effect. And for the transgeneration, we're finding that it, the mom precondition where we didn't see an effect on her now has an effect on her offspring and her grand offspring. So I'm, I'm just bringing up this question because in the past, I'd say 20 years, there's been three papers published on a study in uh, northern Sweden, you know, kind of epidemiological studies dating back to the 1800s where they found if, um, you know, if a male was in under you know, famine conditions, um, uh, kind of during pre-puberty between the ages of nine and 13, that his sons and his grandsons were resistant to, you know, cardiac, uh, you know, death and, and, and stroke. Um, but the opposite was seen with females. If females were under those conditions, then, you know, their children um, actually lived a shorter amount of time. So you think that there's like a, a difference in terms of the epigenetics between males and females and trans transgenerational longevity and stress resistance. Yeah, I don't doubt it. This is something, we're actually trying to explore this with epigenetics and this, the reason we switch out of flies because some of the epigenetic adaptations are not commonly found on flies or harder to assess. So we're trying to get into a model where it's easier and, and see these differences. But the first thing that, on this particular model is this is a moth that doesn't eat as an adult like many butterflies and moths. And I think that has more to play with it than the actual transference of, uh, of something. But that, that is the way that we're chasing this transgenically specifically. 
but how about, about epigenetic modifications and how far we can take those. Assuming that, you know, the offspring are still experiencing the same conditions, right? So we're trying to sort of keep it constant as best we can. And hopefully, two years maybe, I have something cool to say about it. So no, the uh, the irradiated preconditioned flies are not harder to sterilize. They are actually I, I so the preconditioning does not rescue sterility. So here we're talking number of egg hatched versus radiated. Versus, I don't want to say I predicted your question, but I, I get it often because in the moths, in the butterflies and the moths, the chromosome structure is such that they can do double stranded DNA repair better, and in there it does affect them. So there, precondition can rescue a little bit of sterility unless you go high enough. Well, so so this is a technique I was talking to Jeff last night uh, that's commonly used in with mosquitoes. Actually, mostly in uh, in Italy, but they actually do this: they sterilize the mosquitoes and release them out. I'm hoping that because of Zika and chikungunya and these other things that are now creeping up here, that that more of this is done, right? Sterilizing technique has only been done in the U.S. that time with cattle and a few times all with fruit, right? Because of this fear of this radiophobia, fear of, oh, you're sterilizing a 50-foot 50, 50 mosquito or something. <laughs> but that, that, that's something that I would love to get into so that we could use. Is there the same problem with the male-female mating? Uh, is, is the female, is, is the sexual itself for her, but she won't mate with the other? Yep, yeah, they exit the, the same issues. It's directly applicable to the mosquito situation. Another thing that it was that uh, I didn't mention earlier, somebody talked about methyl bromide yesterday. It was a strong fumigant that's used for fruit and vegetables. That's being phased out. And one thing that we're working on with the USDA is the use of x-rays. Instead of fumigating post-harvest crates of fruit, we run into a big old x-ray machine. And that would take care of all the pests and a fair amount of the bacteria. And, and so we, you know, it's, it's, that's been a long time coming, but harder to get through, again, because people think these fruits are going to mutate and make them grow arms and stuff. So interesting, the fruit normally get treated with low oxygen to precondition the fruit so that they, they live longer in the supermarket shelf. But if you precondition the fruit with low oxygen, then you protect the insect. So the thing we're working with the USDA in Miami is trying to figure out the right balance where you want to precondition the fruit to increase longevity on, on the shelf, but not increase longevity of the bugs, or not protect them against sterility at least. Yeah, so it's a delicate balance, but I think we're making some cool progress. <laughs>